This is Jason Anderson, and I am calling the special town council meeting to order for budget deliberations for fiscal year 2023 to 2024 budget. Uh, for roll call purposes, all council members are in attendance except for Mr. Grandelski, who is absent with notification, and Ms. George, who is joining us remotely. At this time, we'll move on to item two, public comment on a proposed fiscal year 2023 to 2024 budget. Ms. Calorio, could you go over any comments we had submitted, please? We received three public comments submitted via email. The first public comment is from <clears throat> Yanni Barclay at 6... 6480 uh, County Road 19S, Minota, uh, North Dakota. And the public comment was written in support of the high school Latin program. The next one is from Janie, Jamie Carver, 140 Stenton Road, Brooklyn, um, wrote a public comment in support of the high school Latin program. <clears throat> the last one is Alexis Costa, 220 Gleason Circle, East Rochester, New York, and public comment was submitted in support of the Latin program at the high school. Those were the three only three public comments we received via Thank email. You. Thank you. Um, at this time, we are open for public comment. Anyone that would like to make public comment, please come up to the podium and state your name and address. So for those that are listening, the door to the town hall is open, and the town hall is open and available if anyone wishes to come into the building. Last call for public comment. Seeing none, we'll move on on the agenda. Next item up is item three, budget deliberation. 3A, consideration and action on a resolution setting the town of Killingly operating budget for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. Can I get a motion to adopt this resolution? So moved. A second. Motion has been made by well, <laughs> Ms. Wakefield, seconded by Ms. Barclay. Um, discussion. I will open the floor to anyone who wants to make comments, um, adjustments uh, to this budget. If, if you can, just excuse me for one moment. I want to make sure that I have the blank, uh, the blank the blank set out for you within that resolution so you can make sure that we're filling them in appropriately. So I'll just, I just gotta run down the hall. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll start, I'll start this ball roll, this ball rolling. <coughs> um, I've been through the line by line item that was requested from the superintendent. It's kind of sad that he's not here because I actually had some questions for him. And I went through it not once, but twice. And I'm sh I know there's more stuff that I missed, but there's a whole lot of redundancy. There's way too much use of other objects to cover food items, which, you know, the taxpayers there, you know, considering we have a large number of students that are already on free and reduced lunches, why should the rest of the tax town have to be paying taxes to feed? I mean, it just didn't make any sense. And as a former Killingly High graduate, and I've spent my, a large amount of time in the business center, um, we paid students to create all of the programs for the band, for the concerts, for the graduations, any ceremonies, that's an employable skill. And there is already a line item in their budget for paying for the tech student to learn how to run the TV station. Then why are, is there tens of thousands of dollars throughout the district being spent on producing these programs and certificates and there, there was a $90 line item for business cards. And I'm like, who needs a business card at, if you're a teacher? I mean, I haven't met too many teachers passing out business cards. Um, the amount of money spent on travel, there's a line item that pays the bus drivers already. And there was over $100,000 to transport our middle school and high school students. And, you know, there's a reason why they turn back millions of dollars every year 
And I actually had a conversation with my sister a couple weeks ago, who's up in Thompson. They have a zero return. They spend their budget. Last year, Winnie reported Putnam turned back 30000 And we're already looking at over a million dollars coming back this year. And they want another 1.7. You know, and when I heard somebody say that, and I know it's hearsay, and that's not, won't stand up in court, that there were board of ed members that didn't even look through the line by line. Um, I'm going through it again because the, the redundancy is ridiculous. I mean, stop trying to spread it out and hide it. I understand for budget purposes, you need each school, and we've asked for them to break it down into schools because they used to have it all. But trying to track it all under all the names that they put it under, and some of the stuff that was zeroed out actually goes and benefits the students, like band equipment, um, making sure athletics, there was actually, the, the description on it was at, to make for safe athletic events. They eliminated that. They eliminated a program for reading and it came out on last Thursday that we're at, our, our literacy rate is what, 55%? Um, I mean, it's, it's just frustrating. They're, they're hurting our, they, they're potentially hurting our credit rating with the credit bureau because they keep turning back so much money. And frank and honest with you, they're not spending the money the way they should be spending it. And I know I have no say on it, and, that, and yet they can come and line by line item me on the town side. And you can't even, and as far as the last time I, I heard, you could, the, their budget's not even up on their, on their website. And I hate to do it, but I, there's no way in God's green earth I'm giving them another $1.7 million. I will not support that. It's not fair to the kids, and it's not fair to the teachers or the paras, because ultimately what they're spending stuff on is not people, and I have no problem spending money on people. Thank you. Um, I also went through line by line, and I did have a few questions for the superintendent. Um, one of the line items was um, there's several field trips. This was on page 7. The field trips, 21, 22 actual expenditures was 2,779. For 22, 23, that budget was increased to 7,050. For 23, 24, they want to inc increase it to 7,500. That's a huge increase. Promotional t-shirts, one was 1,200. On another page, there was more promotional t-shirts. Then there's the other objects, again, as Tammy brought up. 21, 22, actual expenditure, 1,373. For 23, 24, they want to bring it up to 2,000. KHS Athletics. For um, 21 22, actual expenditure was 49,171. For 22 23, they increased it to 70,000. For 23 24, they're, they want to increase it to 80,000. That's more than a 60% increase. And it just goes on and on. A field trip to the YMCA, a trip for tubing. There was one for world languages for KISS. If they're, um, and I had a question, if they're eliminating the Spanish program, why is world languages still have a line item of $2,076? KISS, um, $750 for socks. The kids can't buy their own socks for their sports. The budget for their sports um, for 21-22, $57,421. Last year, 15639 Now for 23-24, um, they want to increase to $35,529. It's for sports equipment. What we can't use basketballs and soccer balls over, we have to keep purchasing new ones. It's just on and on. Another one, Tammy was talking about printing and binding. 21-22, it was $185. 
Then they increased it to 100, 1,500. It, all of these things are not educational, and there's no explanation of why the cost has gone up so much. It, and that's not even going, going through half of the book. Thank you. Um, I will say that I had asked the town manager to reach out to the Board of Ed and Superintendent so they could be here to answer questions tonight. Uh, unfortunately, they declined to attend this meeting, um, which, which I think is very unfortunate because um, last year the uh, super, superintendent expressed that he, uh, when the questions were asked at the public hearing um, regarding the, the Board of Education budget, he said he wasn't prepared um, to field any questions at that time. And I was hoping that by us not fielding questions at that point and having this, and inviting him, he w it would give him an opportunity to clarify a lot of the questions we have, and it's uh, it's really unfortunate that they declined to attend. I, I did have a comment from a few people in my district. One of them was, how can we decide on the BOE budget when it's not even on the website and we can't even look at it? And another question was, and this was brought up last year in regards to the foreign exchange students at the high school. Is that stipend being paid? Do we have foreign exchange students? <clears throat> Thank you. Any other comments? I have a couple. Go ahead, Patty. So, um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. So, I also went through each page of this 147 detail that Mr. Angeli gave us. And I, as Tammy and Ula have both indicated, there's a lot of things on here that we would want more detail on and not specifically for us, but for taxpayers. Um, when you look at other objects, it's in the hundred thousands of dollars. That's not acceptable. And it's not to, you know, punish the kids or punish the teachers. We want to make sure they're getting a good education but it's the money being spent properly. Now, when you look at the non-lapsing fund, the, that was initially set up for special ed um, needs, unexpected or like facilities problems. If like a heater blew or a boiler or something. Yeah, in this document, um, I can't find the page number right now. If I'm reading it correctly, there's $190,000 earmarked for um, special ed. Now, wouldn't that make more sense to use the non-lapsing fund correctly if that were to occur, if they needed that money, instead of putting a placeholder of almost $200,000 into our budget? I, I just think there's a lot of mismanagement of funds on the Board of Ed side. I'm just going to say it. Thank you. And I too am disappointed they didn't want to come tonight. Flipping over to the town side. Um, the, and I apologize for not being here last Thursday. I don't get a choice when people call 911. So wish I had that choice. I get out on time every time, but it is what it is. Um, so one thing I did hear, and this might be a little bit hearsay because I didn't have a chance to go back and listen to the meeting last Thursday. Um, it wasn't, I guess, emphasized enough, so I'll emphasize it now. Part of the reasons on the town side for um, some of the increases are debt service. Uh, it's a massive increase there due to the KMS, the Westfield, and the high school as well. It's really the KMS. We're getting ready to issue the first round of the debt service. Um, that we had indicated when we when those projects were approved that the 2024 budget would be the first year for debt repayments. So we're looking at issuing our first round of debt for largely the KMS project. A little of that is the Westfield Avenue project as we've started on that project. Um, and so the first debt service payment will be due. And that um, increase is about $400,000 due to those, which it's a 0.28 mil increase uh, related to that debt service uh, repayment 
right. and over the next three years too right it's correct the, gonna... it, we won't start to see a drop off of, you know a more substantial drop off in debt service the, until um, about 2029 2028 2029 um, for the high school that's when because we issued the debt service for the high school in uh, pieces over a number of years mm -hmm. and so that'll be really when those first debt service payments start to roll off um, we'll be completely have the full high school debt issuances repaid in uh, 31 yeah 2031 will be the year that we have them fully repaid so that will all come off the books at that point in time so they'll it'll the debt service will start to decline in a few in you know a few years from now but initially we had indicated that there would be an increase mm -hmm due to the uh, onboarding of the additional debt. Right. And, um, you know, that, that's one thing I did, did want to emphasize a little bit more is the, the reasoning. Debt service is something we obviously, we don't, we can't not repay our debts. You know, that's, and one thing I will say is I've, I've been very happy that since I came on a few years ago, we've, we've really worked towards getting projects done that have been kicked down the road for the last 20 plus years. I mean, KMS alone, I think I was still a student in KMS when they were talking about renovating KMS. You know, and that was over 20 years, 20, 30 years ago almost. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a good thing that we're doing these things. Uh, unfortunately, none of us planned for a pandemic. None of us planned for uh, inflation over the last two years to skyrocket. Uh, which I think is lar part of uh, why we see on both sides of the budget, but BOE and town, uh, some increases as well. Um, I do think there is some savings, obviously, that we can still have, obviously. But, um, you know, one thing, uh, obviously, we've, we've had a very mild winter. So our, our uh, sand and gravel, we're, we're full to the brim and then some. I know the town manager mentioned that during the budget presentation for us. That's one area we can look at for savings. Um, I'm not entirely in agreement with the full $145,000 for KB. I think that's another area we can look at to uh, reduce the proposed budget. Um, so that, that's a couple places that I'd, I'd like to see us start uh, looking at. Thank you. Um, now I just have uh, one question, Ms. Colorio. Um, as far as NDDH, my understanding is that they, uh, the board voted on their budget. Um, how much of an impact does that have? on this right here sure so in the presentation the proposed budget that you have before you it included a per capita rate of a dollar 75 based on the presentation made by the executive director at your uh, Mar march meeting um, i have been informed by our one of our board representatives dave Griff griffiths did call me to confirm that the board did approve and we actually got the no the formal notification from nddh today that they approved a budget at a per capita rate of a dollar so it's a decrease of 75 cents per capita which is a little over thirteen thousand dollars that is a that would be a reduction saving so um i i do have that um noted so that could be a reduction thank you any, any other comments yes mary what if do you obviously this is my second year but still very new with with all this budget stuff so do you put together anything that your recommendations that we can decrease the budget so um i did speak with the chairman um uh, beginning of this week i guess maybe i can't remember her, our exact date of our conversation last but week. he gave me some last week he gave me some indications um as to you know generally i try and get an understanding of where collectively the council may be looking um and how much the decrease is looking for so i did prepare some scenarios um, of what uh, might be on uh, options for the council to consider. Um, so I do have those three. I have, I have printed copies of those if you want me to review those with you. Um, one that you know I did indicate within the um, budget presentation that because we've had a mild winter, um, we probably could uh, back off of the uh, budget for salt. Um, we do have a full uh, salt shed at this point in time. So um, that is an area of recommendation that you could uh, safely, and I say safely meaning that there's enough reserves and back and um, stockpile that I don't foresee us putting us into a, you know, a, a difficult position going into next winter, um, that that could be a reduction. I also indicated in my presentation that I had added 25000 to the contingency budget line, um, largely due to the inflated costs that we're seeing around those emergency repairs or those emergencies that crop up. 
That could be something that's removed. Um, we haven't necessarily fully exhausted the 250000 in a but in a budget year due to emergencies. That's not to say that we're not going to run into that next year, but we have had a number of um, em emergent uh, repairs that have occurred um, that have had to go to the contingency line. But um, that would be a recommend recommended area. Um, and then it would be a matter of where the – I, I'm not clear on where the council may land with KB Ambulance's request. That is a very significant increase to the budget. Um, where that in where the council uh, the council lands on that deliberation, and then I have the NDDHs. I do have a couple of other scenarios because um, I was getting some indication from the council that the, from the chairman that the council wanted to see what it may look like for a more substantial cut. And I do have an outline of what some of those cuts are, which impacts um, recreation and library pretty significantly, and highway. So I, I do have those to review, if, um, and I have copies of those if we want to review those uh, scenarios that I've reviewed with the, chair, with the chairman. Thank you. Um, so each of these scenarios represent a, uh, based off the grand list, represent a different amount if the budget went through at that, where the mill rate would fall. Um, because uh, just to remind everyone, we don't actually set the mill rate at this point. We set the budget. Um, that goes to annual town meeting. That goes out to referendum vote. And then once the budget passes referendum vote, then the mill rate is based off of the grand list and what the budget is. Uh, but just to um, give our town manager an idea of roughly what we were, where we were comfortable at, where some of us are comfortable at as far as um, mill rate increases. Um, and one thing that was brought up uh, by Mr. Wood was the fact that we have this debt service that we, we did know was coming. Um, uh, KMS is, is a project that, uh, as Mr. Wood had referenced, to, to can got kicked down the road for so long and it gets to a point where sometime you got to pick that can up. Um, and, and that's that's what we've had to do between uh, condition of our roads, condition at KM, conditions at KMS, and, and then um, our community center as well. So each of those these scenarios, um, there's three different ones. One of them would represent a. Do you want me to review it in detail? Um, each of the three. I just handed out the first one. Okay. To everyone. So. All right. So the first one that was handed out represents, as you can see. It would uh, represent a um, 0.88 increase in the mill. Um, so if you would, Ms. Coyer, just go over what these cuts would be right. um, to get us down to this point. So the cuts that you're seeing before you um, is the first one is the indication that I gave you in the um, budget presentation, which is a reduction of the salt, 25000 in the reduction of salt. Uh, the next one is the ambulance service, and this was just kind of some guidance that the chairman had given me as to where he, you know, felt. So this was the KB ambulance had requested an additional 145,000. This would remove 120,000 of that ask. So it does have some increase in, but not a, not um, the majority of that. The reduction of the $13,000 that we know is uh, an achievable reduction from the NDDH because that just came in. And then again, that reduction of the $25,000 from contingency. That re removes $183,306 from the town's side of the budget. On the Board of Education side, uh, the chairman had relayed to me that there was uh, trying to maintain the funding for the um, armed security officers and then you know potentially uh, a bit above that so um, I use the figure of 1.3 million that would re re that would leave a remaining increase to the Board of Education of four hundred seventy five thousand dollars a little <coughs> over that so that would produce a mill rate of 26.02 which is an increase from the current year's mill rate of 0.88 um, and so that's the first scenario based on kind of some of that feedback that again that I had received from the chairman um, subsequently I cr uh, created um, a second scenario um, which I'll have Jen pass out this second scenario in that conversation with the chairman with Jason um, was if there was a way to um, further reduce the town side of the budget to um, 
uh, more significantly get, get at or below a half of a mill increase with uh, some additional cut to the Board of Education side. So I'll walk through this component. So this, uh, in this mill rate, this scenario produces a mill rate of 25.67, which is a 0.53 mill rate increase. And this includes cutting the salt, but reducing that cut, uh, increasing that cut from 25,000 to 50,000. Um, it eliminates one full-time position in the highway department. It eliminates one full-time mechanic position um, in out of the highway, uh, out of the central garage. Um, so we would reduce down to two uh, mechanic positions that would um, maintain our fleet. Um, that would likely result in so the. Let me back up the um, reduction of the highway position um, that uh, they would have to rework the plow routes. So you would be extending plow routes um, during the winter time um, and um, it breaks up some of our crews. We might need to look at, we would likely need to look at um, contracting out for some of our drainage projects that we currently do in house. Um, so that's kind of the impact with the highway department cut on that one position. The mechanics position cut, um, we currently have three positions. This would reduce one position, which currently is a vacant position. We are advertising for that position right now, but we are paused on advertising for that as we get through this budgetary process pending outcome. Um, but that the reduction of that will result in the um, more of the fleet having to go out to um, a contracted shop for some repairs because two mechanics aren't going to be able to manage all of those repairs in-house. Um, so we'll be incurring higher contractual services costs. Um, for recreational, um, on the seasonal staff side, um, it's a reduction of 33,000 and that will, re that will eliminate one week of summer camp. So it'll drop from six weeks to five weeks. It'll eliminate one of the assistant camp directors. They're currently, uh, we usually staff our camp with two because we have 120 um, campers plus all staff that goes with that um, and to be able to have that backup. It would also include reducing wage rates for all of the remaining camp staff uh, back down to uh, essentially minimum wage. It's gonna reduce overtime for support for special events so our um, full-time staff um, per, uh, support many special events and on an overtime basis that they would get paid for we would re we would eliminate this, those um, some of those uh, special event supports it would eliminate uh, so that's the 33,000 um, we would eliminate 13,500 out of contractual services for recreational programming and that eliminates the senior morning yoga and two Friday and one Tuesday morning movement class, and that is for our like our toddlers, that's our little kids. The full summer concert series would be eliminated, and we would reduce advertising for all of these programs. The last piece under materials and supplies, it proposes a reduction in operating supplies for those eliminated programs, and it would eliminate the special event of Spare, Scarecrow Kingdom, and we would reduce athletic supplies. That's a, overall a $50,000 cut out of the recreation programming budget. Library programming would also be reduced by um, overall of $45,760. $60, and that is eliminating a full-time position and a part-time position. And with those eliminations, that will result in the closure of the library for Saturday hours. So we would eliminate Saturday hours of operation for the library. It will also shorten hours during the week because of scheduling and coverage. Um, <clears throat> and it would also uh, limit the use of the community room by groups because we have to have somebody there to open up the community room and so we wouldn't have those later hours that we currently have so that will scale back the availability of that room. Um, human services subsidy again this reflects a slightly higher reduction in the ambulance service line at $130,000 reduction um, still, re still leaving an increase of $15,000 in their request. The uh, previous requ uh, the previous reduction with NDDH that we know we can take that reduction. Um, the next section, employee benefits, is all of those benefits that are attached to the positions that I previously outlined for elimination, and then um, reducing the special reserves by twenty five thousand. That gives a total budget reduction to the town side of four hundred little 
just under four hundred and seventy two thousand dollars it um, I also reflected a Board of Education budget of 1.5 million so that still leaves 275,000 as an addition to the current to the Board of Education budget and again that results in an increase in the mill rate of 0.53 but as you can see that has a number of substantial programmatic cuts to a lot of our um, a lot of our departments across the board the next one that I'm going to review with you is scenario number three I tried to do one that was kind of in the middle if you will or a in between cut um, so uh, scenario number three as you're receiving it <clears throat> this one is a re um, an increase still in the mill rate um, of 0.73 so it results in a mill rate calculation of 25.87 <clears throat> and this uh, captures the reductions from scenario number one. It does maintain the increase in the salt reduction in winter maintenance from 25 to 50,000. So this is reducing salt by 50,000. It does uh, eliminate that one mechanic position in the one vacant mechanic position in the um, highway department. Um, again, that will uh, likely result in uh, fleet uh, repairs having to be sent out for contractual services and that we would otherwise do in-house. Um, the reduction to the ambulance service at 130,000, the uh, known reduction that we can take for NDDH, the benefits associated with the mechanics position, and the reduction in contingency of 25,000. That results in a reduction to the general government budget of 287,195. I've also reflected a cut and again, this is in the middle. The first scenario had a cut to the Board of Education of 1.3. The second scenario I gave you had a reduction of 1.5. This is a reduction of 1.4 million, right in the middle of those two. And again, that results in an increase of 0.73. So, you know, I'll run any other scenarios that the council um, might be wanting me to look at so I can articulate what those impacts would be um, to what those cuts might, might be. But those were the scenarios that I reviewed. I got a question. So this mechanics position that we're eliminating, how long have we been at two mechanics? We've had, uh, we, the, since uh, December, end of December, January, beginning of January. So it's only been a few months mm -hmm. um, that we've been seeking um, to hire that third position, to rehire the third position. We've had a third position now for a number of years. Uh, probably better part of six years, seven years, um, that we've had three mechanics positions. And we did um, have savings within our contractual services because we were able to take some of those things in-house that otherwise we were having to send out of house because we just don't have enough. What is our, what is our typical um, out of service or vendor or a mechanic or a, what is our typical so it depends outsource, on, I Yeah, guess. so it depends on the, depends on the piece of equipment it will depend on where it needs to go and what it what has to happen to it right so um, there is they have a number of uh, contractors or, or vendors that are used if you will for contracting services but it'll it depends on what the services that needs to be provided and how quickly it needs to be done some can slate it right in and it depends on what their workload is so we have several that we work with do we have a typical amount that we typically send out to vendors no, we don't. We it we only send out based on our capacity to do it in house. Mm -hmm. So if we have the capacity to do it in house, we do it in house. It's substantially more. We don't we don't have a limit. Now I will say like a uh, a tr uh, transmission rebuild that's going out, an engine rebuild that's going out of house, right? right. But um, the more routine maintenance, we all we've been managing all of that internally, and none of that has had to go out of house. Um, during the past few months when you've been down at one mechanic, how many job, how many times have you had to outsource stuff um, due to um, it being not having enough staff as opposed to a transmission or an engine rebuild? Yeah, we haven't had to move a lot out at this point in time just simply because it hasn't been, um, we haven't had a sustained period of time and it's our slower period. It's, it's winter season, so it's a slower period and we've had a very slow winter we haven't had a very high impact on our fleet for the winter um, as we move into spring and summer that has a higher we have a much higher uptick of vehicle maintenance 
um, that we have to we have to uh, flow through. So we're gonna start to see more of that as we get into May and June and July. Um, so I, we haven't really had to send much out at this point in time, but in the long vision, I would see that we're gonna start to see more go out. Uh, now, during this three month time frame, I'm assuming, it, uh, I'm pretty sure we've already been through the hiring process. Have you had any any qualified applicants who have applied for the position? Right, it's been, it's been a struggle, and no, we really haven't. We did have a qualified applicant at one point in time. We did go through, um, you know, an offer period, the person had accepted, and then they used it as a bargaining chip where they were at mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and remained where they were at, right? And that's something that we see across the board, not just in this position. That's not unique to this position. That's been, we've experienced that in many of the positions that we've seen hiring. So you have to go through more than one round of hiring. That being said, at this point, I am not really advertising for hiring this position as this discussion is happening. Nobody's gonna put in for a position that they think is gonna get caught on July 1. So, and I wouldn't put anybody through that. Yeah. You know, this is people's lives. Mm -hmm. This is their livelihood and their household. And I would never put somebody in a position of, we'll hire you today, not knowing if you're gonna have a, jo a job on July 1. Yeah. Um, so we've paused that at this point in time. And I will say that our current mechanics, you know, they're getting through, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's strain and stressful at this point in time. Um, for them, so um, we'll manage as we need to. Um, but once we have a clearer picture as to where this is, if we are going to maintain it in the budget, I will then be restart the aggressive search for another mechanic. But um, at this point, I, I don't want to pursue that. No. Thank you. Um, I still have a few. Okay, go uh, ahead. Just um, being in the industry, I know right now it's extremely difficult to find mechanics and then looking at the, the salary we're at adds to the difficulty um, of getting someone in and, and it is a burden for the other staff unfortunately and I, I feel it where I'm at. We've been short one if not two mechanics for the past two plus years um, and, and it is very difficult to find mechanics right now um, and I know I hear that from other industries as well. And at the same time, it's do we keep the money in the budget for a position that who knows if we're even going to be able to fill, period. So I will turn back to you, Mr. Wayne. Yeah, I just got a, a couple of things. Um, so it looks like it looks like we initially cut uh, 331000 out of our original budget because the other 140 was already taken out, uh, potentially taken out, I should say. Well, one of them is definitely taken out. But it seems like all these cuts here, in, in my mind, are feel-good cuts. Which scenario are you looking at? I'm not sure. I'm looking at the last, uh, the most severe. So scenario two. two. Yes. Yeah. So you already have, you're, we're already cutting out a KB, which was, which was discussed mm -hmm. earlier. And then we have the 13,000. So I'm, I'm okay. figuring like 330,000. But my problem is it, it seems like this, this cut here all these cuts are all feel-good cuts. You camp directors, stuff for the for the kids, uh, stuff for the seniors, and I just don't believe that we would we wouldn't have somewhere else to cut. But let's we don't. No, we really don't. We I don't. Mean, I mean, what about correct. how many? What are we at? What is it? Two and a half million that we planned on for the roads. So that's being funded through fund balance. Yeah. So if you reduce that, then you're reducing your fund balance allocation. So there's no impact to mill rate. Okay. So is there, how much can be taken out of fund balance to help? Right, so um, honestly my recommendation is that the town council does not activate fund balance for operations in this year. We're getting ready to go into our credit rating call for our debt service that we're getting ready to onboard. Um, I've been through many credit rating calls with our credit rating agencies. Um, one of the first <coughs> things that they're going to look at is how much we're activating a fund balance for operational purposes and their question is, is why aren't you planning better? You knew you were gonna have to bring on this debt. Why aren't you planning better um, instead of utilizing your fund balance? It's not sustainable. With the utilization of the fund balance at 2.7 million in the current year, I cannot articulate that that's a sustainable use of fund balance over the period of five years. Our fund balance will be depleted well, beyond, well below our um, fund balance guidelines and policy. Um, well within that time period and so um, I suspect that we would get critiqued by our credit rating agency for activating fund balance for the use of 
operations in the current year. And that was one of the reasons why we purposefully did not utilize fund balance for operations last year was in preparation to be able to demonstrate to our credit rating agencies mm -hmm. that we were planning appropriately within our budgetary process for the onboarding of that. So we would have two clear years of not utilizing fund balance. So that's why my recommendation, again, the council, you can decide to do what you want to do with that, but that's my recommendation because knowing that we're going into that credit rating call next month, um, that's going to be the concern. Potentially, how much could that ding us? If so if um, they decide to downgrade us, right now we're a double A plus, they could downgrade us to either a double A plus with a negative outlook or they could remove us to just a straight double A. What does that do? That impacts our borrowing power. So it does two things. Number one, it increases our borrowing costs because we are going to pay higher interest. Just like if you're going for a loan for a car or a loan or a mortgage. If your credit rating, you know, your credit score is lower, you pay higher interest. Um, same same thing for us. So a double A plus. Is that only on the new loans? It is Not only on the new loans. Existing. It doesn't flow yeah. backwards. That being said, um, it would potentially impact our previous loans that are, it would impact the ability for us to refinance those yeah. loans. And it would impact, so our, our the second credit rating agency of Moody, so we use S&P, Standards and Poor's. Um, some of our debt is rated by Moody's, which is another credit rating agency. Um, and I will say Moody's is Moody. <laughs> um, they are far more critical. And when they down, they downgraded us, they were the first ones to downgrade us for the use of fund, of fund balance and supplemental appropriations mid-year. Um, and it took us three years to shake that. Um, so and we switched to, to Standards & Poor's right after that. And Standards & Poor's took three years to finally agree that um, we could move upwards in that scale. So it impacts in a long term for that credit rating. So I have a question. Um, I know we, because I've looked at the town side as well as the Board of Ed. Um, God, there's a lot of back feed. Um, I know in 2021, it looks like we spent 138 for salt, salt and calcium. Um, if we've got a, a full salt shed, do we need to only eliminate 50,000 out of that 232, or can we take out more? So I, I did review that with our um, highway director. One of the challenges that we're now facing <laughs> is the increased cost of salt. So it costs more than it did in 20, 20, 2020. Um, for um, us to purchase salt. We do have the winter maintenance reserves, um, which are healthy, but um, his recommendation was uh, 50,000. If the council decides to drop it lower than that, you can. It's just our, my concern, and I think his concern as well, uh, my concern is that you may drop it for this year, but you know, how sustainable is it to keep it at that low threshold year over year? Are you creating an artificial bubble for next year that you're gonna have to re-increase it in order to be able to sustain the next winter? Um, that's really the concern. We felt the comfortable at the 50,000. I felt that the reserve could sustain that over you know, that lower funded threshold for a number of years before the town would potentially have to look at really re-increasing that. Did we lose everything? Is Facebook Live still going? Yeah. Okay. I can hear you guys. Okay, good. Uh, all of our um, your all of our screens went blank, and I got concerned that we were no longer streaming. So. so you can see. She, we, oh. She can still hear us. But we're not. We're good. So, um, so that's why the okay. recommendation of fifty thousand, as opposed to taking a more substantial cut. Again, council's purview on this. Um, you can determine at what level, but that's that's the reasoning for the $50,000 recommendation. I, th I think I've been watching American Pickers too much because how about we split the difference at 75? Um, just so everyone is aware, um, when I did have a conversation with Ms. Gloria, I had referenced a $100,000 cut. Right. And that was when she told me she, that she was gonna talk to the highway department um, and, and see, get some feedback from them. Um, so that's... I'll, I'll still pull the American Pickers. Let's let's split the difference at 75. Because, and honest with you, I'm not really super comfortable about giving the almost giving almost 
half a million dollars to the Board of Ed when they're already scheduled to give us more than a million back. So. Going back to the mechanic position at the town garage, do they also maintain the buses, or is that a that's a? No, the board of ed has their own separate they mechanics. That being said, we do help out every once in a while. Both sides will help out, but we don't we don't manage the bus fleet. So uh, I wanted to voice also that I went through line by line on the school and I, I did see some pork. I don't have my thing with me because I knew there was uh, no one to ask questions to tonight. Um, I saw like teacher, no, uh, not te teachers, like Tammy, I'm very comfortable with the teachers and the salaries, but I saw the t-shirts for $3,000. And uh, the last page had the lunches for uh, just in case the state or the federal changed their law, they, they put in $7,000 for lunches in case that law passed. And then the copiers I thought was a lot. I had questions on that. So that's how I feel about the school. Uh, I had written Mary and uh, talked to some people here about, I would be curious about uh, running a scenario with one of our officers uh, cut. So we had eight in the budget last year, but we only hired seven is that correct so yes currently we only have seven officers onboarded we were in the process of onboarding our eighth and unfortunately he took a different position so we were going to be actively we're actively re um initiating that search for the eighth one so, so um, uh, let me just finish mary and then you can run sure. through the stuff with me so people know my thinking um so basically there was already a placeholder and we were gonna go to 10 and we were gonna cut one trooper because one trooper costs uh, two constabularies. So last year, in terms of top call volume, we ran with a total of nine officers. Um, so we would still be increasing one officer, still doing the cut of the state trooper that we wanted. Uh, so why do you think that we couldn't go uh, total 10 instead of 11. Like what in the call volume shows me that? Because you're still cutting your, you, you, we would go um, nine constabularies and one state trooper. So you'd still get that savings and you'd still you, be increasing. Yeah, you would, you would increase the savings to the budget. Um, so I did provide to you all a copy of the call volume um, sheets that I've been reporting to you all. Um, for the last several years, um, and I indicated kind of the number of officers, but really I'm only going to really speak to the, the current year one because that really speaks to the number of officers that we currently have. So you'll notice that, you know, the call volume in gray is the total call volume for all of Killingly. That number is then broken down into the two previous colors before that gray column. The blue is kill is the our Killingly constables and our resident state troopers. Those are the calls that they handled and the cases that they handled. The orange bar is the remaining calls that are, were handled by Connecticut State PD or the Troop D, right? So our sixth officer we onboarded during first quarter, really kind of towards uh, the end of first quarter, and then we onboarded our seventh officer in the second quarter. So both of those quarters were impacted. When, when you onboard a new officer, you have to do a field training process, which reduces the call volume for the training officer as well. They have to do not just training for calls, but they also have to do administrative training as well. So they're not taking as many calls, so that reduces mm -hmm. the availability of officers for call volume. So that impacts those two quarters for what our officers could handle for call volume. By the third quarter, we had all seven officers at full functioning, which means they were all completed their FTO and they were all getting assigned cases and they were all taking calls. So if you look at third quarter, um, the calls, there was a little over 2,600 calls in Killingly. Our, our seven officers, and I will say we've largely had, we and um, our resident troopers, have handled um, almost half of those calls. Um, and that's because 
we have the number of we have seven officers on board if we're able to onboard the the remaining three in accordance with that long-term vision and again this is trying to maintain that long-term vision and maintain that long-term approach of as we sunset a resident state trooper we achieve by uh, by sunsetting a resident state trooper and achieving those savings you onboard two officers at the same time to be able to mitigate having to then increase a future budget by adding another officer to be able to get to that long range vision that long term vision that we had many years ago of that 10 constables one resident state trooper which has been collectively part of the goals set by the council for um, uh, you know each council sh session that we've been through so what does it mean to add right so if we're able to add if you know if we are um, approved at adding the remaining three the impact we're not going to necessarily see a big shift in next year because what we're proposing what this budget proposes is onboarding a lateral by September and onboarding um, one officer through the Academy so one officer has to go through the training academy and, F and then a longer protracted FTO process afterwards in order to be able to be onboarded. And we're really going to be training um, an entry-level officer. And that one isn't slated to come on until January. So that's two. That's the two. So we already have in our budget the eighth one that we're actively, rec we're actively seeking that um, position right now. The two that are proposed in the upcoming budget one is we're proposing as a lateral to come in in September. The other one we're proposing to be a, um, an academy slot. So basically right now we have a placeholder though. Uh, we have a vacant position. Exactly. It's not a placeholder. Mm -hmm. We have a vacant position that hasn't been filled that we are recruiting For right now. For other departments we call that a placeholder. So that's why maybe I'm confused. All oh. those open positions at the school. I don't, the Board of Ed uses different terminology. Yeah. I, I, there, it's a, it's an there. actively recruited. We're actively re the money's recruiting there the position. The person's not there yet. Right. We're actively right. recruiting the position. That's a vacancy in the position. But um, so we're, I'm actively recruiting for um, the eighth officer right now. So I could get that person onboarded by July 1, right? Maybe just after July 1. I have found with uh, law enforcement, they definitely have um, cycles of retirement. So when the academy ran and their 20 years are out, that's so it's June and July tend to be a hot time period of uh, lateral transfers. Um, so we could we could onboard before July 1. I mean, we're actively um, recruiting right now. So um, that's currently an open uh, vacant position that we're looking to onboard. The two that are currently proposed, that's what we're proposing is a lateral and then um, that academy position, um, those would eventually be taking more call volumes. And so what's the value around that, right? Um, so our off by killing these officers being the ones that are predominantly responding to those calls, our community is getting far more consistency in, the, in, that, in who's responding. Um, there's a lot more continuity in managing the calls. So we have gotten you know, complaints from residents that They've been calling Troop D, they talk to one officer or another officer that are state, state PDs, and there's not a lot of communication between those, those individuals. They respond to a call and they move on. They may not even be in Killingly the next couple of weeks because they're you know, positioned out in one of the other areas of Troop D, not in Killingly. By having it be a Killingly officer that responds, they have a great communication cycle within our office so they're able to share within our employees I'm working on a case with that one too let's collaborate together and we um, we have created um, where community members that have uh, have had ongoing issues they've had direct communication to a, an assigned officer to be able to manage some of those. That's not something we can achieve with Troop Day. Um, so it does provide a greater uh, community policing opportunity and where they can, and they also, Killingly officers, our officers get to know Killingly it fully, inside and out. They know who to talk to, where to go. Um, it it uh, allows them to um, complete investigations uh, faster. 
um, and to um, be, be able to get more f thorough knowledge through that investigative process because they are fully knowledgeable about Killingly, where when st State PD is responding to one call and then somebody else responds somewhere else, there's missing components. Um, so our, our officers have handled and continue to handle a lot more um, in-depth investigations um, specifically to Killingly because um, number one, they're, they're incredibly knowledgeable. They have an, an immense background in law enforcement. They're also, this group is a great opportunity for the town to really bring in a new individual to training because we have such great depth of knowledge within our own law enforcement division to be able to train an incoming individual. Um, Troop D's current, um, we've, there's been a lot of changeover in Troop D's uh, uh, law enforcement in their, in their uh, officers. There's been a lot of shift, a lot of moving around. Uh, they haven't really been staying in Troop D for a lot of period of time. So your most senior person, you know, your most seasoned person in Troop D is, you know, may, may only have five years on the job. Um, a lot of them have less than that. Um, so. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand this. Uh, all of the calls would be answered with the one less uh, officer, but uh, in other words, we could do it with 10, we could do it with nine constables and you, one trooper, but the service wouldn't be as good. That's what you're saying. It's really not it's as much about the extra money, but it is about the service and the communication or... Yeah, I mean, I, that's the goal of the program. Yeah. Right? That's the ultimate well, goal of but, the program. But our goal also is to watch the money, so that's why I'm asking this question. Sure. And let me just move on to uh, nobody else might have an appetite for this, so I don't want to make you do all the work, you know, of that. Where are we? Does anybody else have an appetite for looking at this scenario? Um, I'd like to just post a couple questions, um, things that came to mind. I don't. Going through this discussion. Um as far as the amount of constables we have in relation to whether we need to have a master sergeant or not, right. or a regular state trooper, um, or, or a state trooper, a resident trooper who isn't a master sergeant, does the amount of constables we have have any relevance on whether we're required to have a master sergeant or not? No. Okay. Um, other question would, that questions I had were, due to the, look into the call volume, Mm -hmm. um, of these calls, is there any in here that were calls where you had the state police and our constables at? Um, of the calls the state police covered, were there any calls where an accident on 395 where we're not sending our constables up on 395? Um, are those reflected in any of this or is, yes. or is it all just lumped in? Right, so my understanding is from the total calls that it does not include 395 because we do not respond to calls on 395 as constables. That is state PD, so those are not considered as part of these calls. Okay. Um, and so it's killingly specific. I will say that you know the initial call um, may have multiple respondents, so it may be killing the constable and a state trooper, but the call, the responsible party or the responsible reporting um, agent on the call is a Killingly police officer, so that's who gets the call identification because they have to do all the follow through. So they're the ones that are writing the reports, following it through any court process, um, uh, maintaining and gathering any evidence, doing any um, investigatory processes with it. That's the call volume that, that you see there. Um, so <clears throat> we did try and have them remove out the extraneous call volume um, that would not be applicable to our our agency. Um, and then something like major crimes division with the state police, um, if we're dropping down to just res one resident state trooper, um, are those calls, those type of calls we would still be required to, ones that normally major crime comes in, state police would still be coming in? Yes. Even if we're at one, one uh, resident state trooper? Correct, because okay. we're still under a resident state trooper contract. Which means at a certain, at whatever, at the deemed threshold of um, severity of the crime, major crimes automatically gets deployed by state PD. And that doesn't matter if we have two or one resident state trooper, it is by their threshold. Um, okay. 
Thank so you. that would still be deployed. Thank you. Um, All right. Mr. Wood. So I will say that um, you know, I personally obviously deal with the, the PD um, on a fairly regular basis, whether it's state police or um, I've dealt with our Killingly constables as well. Uh, obviously, I, I don't think any of us here are questioning their, their professionalism or their ability to do their job because we, we know they do a phenomenal job. Um, the one thing I will say about this, though, is that Troop D is grossly understaffed, understaffed, and that is thanks to a myriad of factors be well beyond our control as a, as a town, um, or any of the towns for that matter. Um, you know, last week alone, I, I had to sit there and wait about 15, 20 minutes for the state police to show up for a violent uh, patient. Uh, that, that's 15, 20 minutes that, you know, that it, it, it can really lead to a lot of different things. And, um, you know, if we can free up, and the, the troopers, they, they apologize to us. But it's not their fault because, again, there's only so many troopers on. I think right now Troop D has less than 20 troopers available. Um, and so they, they apologized to us. They said, we were coming from Canterbury, and here we are in Brooklyn. Um, that's not their fault. And so having more constables actually frees up the, the state police to go to, to towns that still utilize the state police. I mean, I honestly foresee within the next 15, 20 years, other towns having to go to their own PD for this very reason of if the numbers don't start increasing the state PD, uh, they're going to have to do it themselves there to make sure that their citizens are safe. Whether it's, you know, 10 constables or, you know, two constables or whatever it takes just to get, make sure they have enough people um, to, to do that. That's why I will not support any scenario that eliminates any of the uh, constables at all. So, so looking at these rough numbers, so even if I rounded them down, which they're above 2,500 a quarter, you're looking at if you do a rough estimate at 10,000 calls, which is about, well, it's probably closer to 12, but if you round 10, because I like round numbers, and you divide it by 365, you're talking about almost 30 calls a day. That's, that's more than a call an hour, and that's, that's a lot. I wouldn't support anything that would reduce the constables. I, I um, have, how do you say, I uh, was fortunate enough to uh, be talking with one of them and uh, I was able to uh, be offered a ride along. And I spent five or six hours on a ride along. Uh, he even came in on his day off to, to take me around. And the areas that they know of where there are issues and uh, where there are no issues, but the experience now that's just several years ago too now he uh that information shared among all of them so that they know where the hot spots are and where, and where to look and some of the stuff is confidential so he couldn't share everything with me but the, the stuff these are these are places you drive by every day you never know that this stuff is going on there and it's just an, it's an eye-opening experience mm -hmm. the other the other thing too that goes along with that kevin is ems knows you know, nobody, nobody realizes how many encampments there are out in the woods. And those get called, EMS gets called to those all the time. Um, and we drive by those woods and you have no idea there's all sorts of people out there. And that's, it is what it is, it's where we live. But EMS knows, the police know where they are. And the rest of us go on in our happy little life with rainbows and unicorns, so. And I might add, too, I know I mentioned 20 troopers, Troop D. They're supposed to have 70. So we are at a deficit of 50 state troopers right now, just in Troop D alone. And Troop D is the busiest troop out of the state of Connecticut. So anything we can do to help, this helps them, too. Which is why our officers tend, you know, typically in a resident state trooper town, uh, sexual assault cases, uh, certain violent crimes would automatically go to a state PD, um, our officers handle a lot of those. Um, and that is, you know, number one, a testament to their experience. Um, and that's why we have really tried to look at bringing on lateral um, officers in hiring lateral. And that's why the proposal for the upcoming year is at least one lateral to be able to have more of a individual that can hit boots on the ground running 
um, and doesn't have to you know really learn all that police work but we recognize that we do need to start looking at um, that longevity as well which means um, investing in somebody into the academy and then training them up through and having the uh, knowledge base that we have is a, a phenomenal training ground um, for um, any new uh, potential candidate into the police force um, but they do handle a lot more um, higher level investigation that may in other places that have resident state trooper contracts be passed on to state PD, which means you can count the calls, but you're not counting the hours of investigation that they're also doing, mm -hmm. right? They are doing an, a lot of investigation. Um, and there are times when you know they just come in to get it done, right? But they do a lot of investigation that go behind these numbers as well. So they're, they're, they are a very busy um, department. And by adding those additional positions will help, number one, kind of alleviate some of that hard press pressure of caseload, but also be able to take on more caseload and keep our, the Killingly community, the Killingly officers being the ones to be able to respond in a quicker fashion, where state PD may not be able to respond because they are up in Pomfret or Thompson or somewhere else and they have to drive all the way from there to here if we have an available officer, it's it, it's a lot faster for them to get there. Thank you. So, what our last year's budget? What what do we have in the budget for constabulary? I'm just pulling out. I'm just yeah. looking not for money wise. I'm talking number wise. How many? Oh, how many did we budget for we last? We budgeted for eight. For eight, and we have seven? We have seven currently, and I'm in the process of recruiting for an eighth. Do right we now. have any potential we candidates? Have some, we have some applicant in. Um, we are, you know, we just re-advertised recently because we were in the onboarding process of one that um, he uh, removed his candidacy not too long ago, so we just reactivated that posting. So we're in the process right now of accepting applications. Um, we'll begin that review process in the next few weeks. Because I could say personally, the the constables do a do a phenomenal job, as you said, for callbacks. I can I can personally say they they do a wonderful job. But m my concern is, well, actually, let me just ask this question. So, what is our budget surplus this year? Potential budget surplus. I have it on the. We're estimating a budget surplus of just around uh, about 150, 160,000 based on the budget document that I provided you. So that's even with the, so you must not be taking in consideration that we don't have another constabulary on that, board yet. Yeah, no, that incorporates that. That is that. Yeah. That, that includes is that. all of that. We, we project the estimates, uh, the 2023 estimates that we've put in your budget book. We mm -hmm. base that on what we've actually expended to date and what we think we're going to expend for the remainder of the year. So that incorporates all of that. So you don't figure on expending any anything for that constabulary for the from for this year. We probably will not expend that. But did uh, you we may estimate it for it? the last month? No, I did not. No, so that's zero for that Correct. for that person. I may have I, I may have estimated one month. Yeah. Okay. But that's it. Okay. So basically the 160 basically almost half Yeah, of a lot of that is uh, winter maintenance. Okay. But then the other half of it is basically that one position? Yes. Okay. See, I, I feel that, you know, we're elected by the people to watch the people's money. And I think you as the town manager is in a position, same as us, you know, because you, you kept saying it kind of bothered me when you said, well, it's the you know it's the town council's decision. It's it's really not. It's 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 all our decisions because we're all responsible for the town. So I would and I and I do feel uncomfortable about a lot of these feel good cuts because I think they feel good cuts and I, I think that I think we should take another look at the budget and maybe come up with some some different cuts that aren't gonna aren't gonna hurt the townspeople as much like the elderly and uh, you know what I mean. I, I just that's just how I feel. 
having uh, been through the budget process now, this is my fourth year doing this, I got to say, this is probably the tightest I've seen uh, a budget. Um, when we were going through the budget, it literally was just nominal changes in most of the line items. The biggest change, obviously, is debt service. Um, that's why I wanted to bring that up at the beginning of the meeting because, again, budget debt service is something we, we have no – we only have control over it by not ever doing a project. Um, that's the only way we have that kind of control. Um, but, obviously, some of these projects need to get done. Um, we can't keep kicking cans down the road forever. Um, that's why I, I, I got to say I was really impressed on – there was very little I could even see personally to say we, we, gotta, we can cut back on this or that. Um, uh, this is really in the, my fourth year. This is the tightest I've seen a budget um, be presented without uh, gross impact. And obviously, too, the other big thing that we have to chronically keep in mind right now is the inflation rate has been, ex you know, it's hovering right now at six percent. But six percent is an average compared to what it really costs for materials, for food, for and obviously food's not really something we consider for the town. But I'm just saying in general. All the different things there, some of the things are well above 6% inflation. Some are hovering around 20% inflation. So it's, it's something we have to consider as well is that this is, uh, much as I want a zero mill, I, I don't think it's realistic, uh, to, to be honest. This year and next year, I just don't see a realistic approach to a zero mill increase. Um, and I, I am all for not spending money and making sure we maintain, but at the same point, um, if we want certain, if, if the people want certain services, things like that, unfortunately, you know, taxes are a, are a uh, unfortunate, a necessary evil, if you will, in our uh, society. Thank you. I'd like to respond to that. So you have a six percent um, increase, but it's it's everybody, not probably seventy five percent of the townspeople aren't going to get that six percent raise, right? So they're not. I'm not. I'm not. What's that? The inflation rate. That, that's right. Raise for their pay. But that's going to affect them, right? That's going to affect their pay. So if they're not getting a raise in their pay, they're not going to be able to pay that 6% inflation. They're not going to be able to pay the, the, the gas. They're not going to be able to. So I'm just saying, yeah, great. We, we're, 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 we have a tight budget, but so we're saying there's nothing else that we can cut. There's nothing else that we can slim down. There's nothing else that we can. I, I just, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't agree with that. And I don't agree with you. <laughs> That's okay. Oh. Um, Can I pop in? Nope. <laughs> uh, sure, Patty, jump in. Oh, if you want to go first, Jason, go no, ahead. No, uh, Ula was about to say something. Oh, Ula, go ahead. So I, I agree with Andy's point. So we've had one of the constabulary positions has been open for almost a year. So what are the chances that we're going to fill three of them? And so that is, you know, money that's going towards the budget that could help um, decrease the mill rate because we only filled one position. So what are the chances of filling three? So the current year we filled two positions. We had had a p position that vacated at the end of the previous fiscal year, and we recruited and onboarded two positions in the current year. And the proposal, you know, we, we have one vacancy that we still have to fill um, and next year we're looking at putting onboarding a lateral and onboarding an academy position yep. so that's a brand new entry-level position our officers participated in a um, informational session that was held by the law enforcement council um, a couple Saturdays ago um, there was about 30 attendants there were a good number of them from this corner uh, you know from the northern portions uh, Killingly, Plainfield, uh, Putnam area that we're looking at going into the academy. So we have, uh, you know, a list of uh, perspectives that we could begin the process of evaluating to determine whether or not that's the investment that we're looking to make into going to the academy. So I agree, it is challenging to onboard laterals at this at this point in time, but we are not looking at um, all three being laterals. We were successfully able to um, recruit two laterals in this last fiscal year, relatively close in time time frame. Um, and uh, having an academy position, we're seeing a new um, 
uh, kind of a renewed uh, desire or um, thought of moving into municipal um, law enforcement. And so I think we would be successful in getting a candidate to go to the academy. So I think that we would be successful in managing to fill those slots. Um, and again, we would have had the eighth one onboarded. We did have a very qualified candidate that was very interested. It's unfortunate for us, fortunate for that individual, but they, they were currently um, in the military and they were offered a different longer term position in the military and they chose to stay with that. I can't fault a person for that um, you know, everybody has that right to, you know, uh, pursue in that direction. Um, so we're back to re going through that onboarding process. So we had paused. We weren't, it's not like we've been actively recruiting all this time without getting any qualified candidates. We had started the onboarding pro uh, process with that candidate back in November. It takes a long time for onboarding on these. So, you know, we, I, I, we, we just started re-advertising for that position now. So there's a, a good chunk of the year that we were in an onboarding process and not trying to recruit okay. for that position. Thank you. Jason. Um, I'm kind of like along with Ray. Um, I think we there has to be a certain amount of, get, you, you can't hold it zero forever. That's, that's why we have all these projects that have been kicked down the highway. Um, and that's why that's why Putnam is where they are with all their building projects because they kicked it down forever and ever they have actually rather smug over the years saying oh look we got a zero mil increase we got a zero mil increase well then their water pipes failed their sewer pipes failed they had to read their, their town hall was falling apart you know you can't can't do that I'm I'm, I'm comfortable with a half a mil I, I would be comfortable if we can get it to a half a mil but I'm not comfortable with cutting our, our, our cons, um, the constabulary. It is, that, that call volume is almost 12,000 12, calls in a year. That's, that's a lot of calls. Uh, Patty, you're still with us? I sure am. Well, go ahead. So, so I just wanted to say a couple of things, and I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to be very direct, try to be professional. So... I've heard a lot of comments, both to support potentially putting off, bringing on more constables, um, and then keeping on the on the plan we already put in place. One, I'm absolutely 100% not interested in considering any cuts or putting off more constables. Our job as town councilors, in my opinion, and I take my position like the rest of you pretty seriously, we are financial fiduciaries, but we also need to look at the well-being of our citizens. And we, we really need to make common sense decisions. And I'm just going to say it. The world's going crazy right now. And we, have, we live in a state that supports, I'm just going to put it out there, um, feelings over facts. The criminals in this state are considered more important than the police officers who are defending our safety. It's, it, it's to me, it's a no brainer that we do not take away any police officers. As Ray stated, and, and I know it's been pointed out, we're not taking anybody, but it's not a placeholder. We had a plan in place to onboard 10. Um, the eighth one, thank you for his service, going back in the military. But as Mary stated, we're already in the process. There are applicants. I do strongly believe this position will be filled and then we can go on to the next two. The officers we have now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, but most of them have come from Troop D for their careers, um, if not all. They know the area. They know, as a few have mentioned, the hotspots. Um, they know the troublemakers. They know the people they can talk to if they need information. They are part of the community. The key here is that Troop D, there's a lot of young academy graduates. They may not even be from the area. They don't know the area. 
it takes a while to get seasoned at your job. All of our constables already are. It's a no-brainer. Um, another thing I wanted to say is, and not to keep going back to the school, but when we talk about um, tight budgets, okay, I concur with Ray. Mary always puts together a tight budget for us. This year must have been harder than any because of the situation we're in across this country. The inflation is out of control, but she has managed to put together a budget with different scenarios that is actually, you know, people aren't always going to be happy, but it's manageable. We're not looking at a five mil, six mil increase where I bet some towns potentially will be because they don't plan as well as Mary does. And her staff, I'm not taking away. I mean, this is a team effort and I want to work as a team player. But if you go back and look at I'm just going to pull one thing because we've gone through that budget for the BOE. So field trips on um, for athletics and wonderful sports teams. It's not about that. This is all about money mismanaging. So the actual number for last year came in at four uh, year before 21, 22 came in at $49,000 actual number. The following year, they budgeted for $70,000. Okay, so that's a 30%. You're off a little. Now this year, nope, didn't adjust down. Say, okay, I understand inflation, but they do get the fuel break with the town. So they're at that locked in price. Let's remember that. No, they jumped it 14 more percent to 80,000. So you go from 70, you had saved 21 the year before. We have increased inflation, but instead of maybe even staying flat, you throw 10,000 more dollars at it. I don't know who does their budget numbers. I really don't. But when we are micromanaging Mary's budget and the BOE and the superintendent will not even come in to answer our questions. I have a problem with that. I have no interest in cutting any employees whatsoever for the town side. And I don't see with the money that gets turned back on the BOE, how they can even consider cutting actual employees and having a placeholder for almost $200,000 for something that was created to be a situation like that, that's what the non-lapsing fund is created for, isn't even considered. And, and the most infuriating thing is considering cutting the Latin program that only cost, what do you say, $44,000 over all the other ridiculous stuff that they pay for, like $2,000 for a luncheon. I, I just, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gloria, uh, back to the public safety side of things um, and talking about constabulary. Can you just go behind what the thought process was on um, the need for a police administrator at this time? Sure. So that is really the um, uh, an administrative coordinator. So this is a person that can um, you know, being within the office can understand what all of our officers' workloads are and to provide that, you know, oversight as to um, overtime, um, caseloads, are they, you know, uh, getting the reports done and submitted timely, um, that human resource aspect, if you will, um, with it. Also to do the accreditation process that we're required to under state under the state uh, legislation, the town has to go through a um, uh, an accreditation process, and we have to um, uh, complete that um, the um, information in that accreditation process, which requires uh, the development and uploading, or just the uploading of all of the various um, policies and the. Um, aspects between the state's um, operating procedures manual, the town's operating process. Um, so we have our site visit scheduled for that in July. Um, that is taking a lot of uh, 
uh, of additional time. This, that position also oversees the ASO, so a portion of that position is uh, reimbursed by the Board of Education because it oversees the ASO, make sure are they reporting to work on time, are they performing in the way that they're supposed to. Um, all of those components need to be managed by somebody that is within that office that also has the background and knowledge and understanding of a, um, of a police force. So our public safety administrator was a former lieutenant in the um, state PD. So he's very familiar with the administrative and the patrol side of um, law enforcement. So uh, he's also overseeing you know, procurement, um, our vehicles, uh, making sure that our vehicles are getting through their um, standard uh, maintenance, that um, training is somebody's, he's the one responsible for tracking all of the required training and making sure that our officers are um, compliant with all required training. Um, so that's, you know, um, there's other, he also oversees and manages um, the um, final review process um, and delegation of that final review process of all of our pistol permits. We have a large volume of that as well. So there's a number of administrative components and what that does is what was happening before was our constables had to split up these duties. And as you can imagine, if somebody goes out for a week and something else has something, a piece of this, you know, procurement has to happen, somebody else picks it up, and now you have kind of a duplicate effort that's happening. And you're pulling a patrol officer off patrol and putting them on admin for, you know, period, extended periods of times at times. By having that um, administrator, he manages all of that and oversees to make sure that our officers are reporting timely, that they are not abusing any, which none of them are, but as we continue to develop and grow and you have more employees, you need to have that direct oversight and, and management. That's what this position is. He is not a sworn officer, so it's a substantially less cost for the town as not having as a sworn officer, um, but he is uh, uh, well qualified in understanding all of those administrative tasks and then also manage, managing that accreditation process that is now required by the state. Roughly how many hours um, do our constables, of the work that this um, uh, police administrator would be taking on, roughly how many hours a week are our current constables having to dedicate towards tasks that would be picked up by the uh, police so administrator? We currently have a police administrator on board. He's currently full time. We, we transitioned him in the current year to a full-time position with the ASOs coming on board and with the accreditation process. So we shifted from the, um, so yes, there, the current budget reflects a part-time position in the clerical, that cleric, he was originally on boarded as clerical, okay. and we moved him to administrator right. um, during the current year because of that accreditation process. And, um, again with with the onboarding of the additional officer so um, the accreditation process was and the ISO component was really the largest components in moving that position to a full-time position um, the request is to also maintain a, a, a lower num fewer number houred um, part-time clerical that will continue to assist in that accreditation as we continue to um, on board and that administrators duties are now split between ASO and constabulary um, as we continue to round out that ASO program but again the hours that are dedicated by the administrator to the ASO um, program oversight uh, going out to the schools meeting with the meeting with the principals meeting with administration meeting with those ASOs those are all hours that are going to be billed to the Board of Education and reimbursed by the Board of Education. Thank you. I got a question. So Mary, what is the what is the constabulary's task in pistol permits? Isn't that just a clerical push through and that directly goes to the state? So it's a matter of gathering information and sending it to the state? So actually- um, They don't approve or anything. No, there is a suitability requirement. So there is a review on a suitability requirement under the statute to review whether or not there's um, uh, other factors that may, or, and also they also review the actual um, backgrounds that come back. Sometimes we have backgrounds that, have, that come back that are rather complex, and our officers review those to determine whether or not an offense is an immediate disqualification. 
Um, so they review all of the all of our pistol permits. They review to determine whether or not there's uh, and I don't, we haven't really we I don't know that we've had anybody with a denial for suitability. It's generally a background, and the background is that you know sometimes it's somebody will think that they've had something expunged from their record and and it never got expunged, and it's on the record. So they will contact the individual, walk through what that disqualification is. Many times they give them um, uh, you know guidance as to what they might be able to do to rectify that, to be able to continue to pursue for a pistol permit, um, and how they might, uh, you know, achieve that. Um, or if it is a straight out denial because it is an automatic disqualifier, um, they will review that with the, with the, with the individual as well. So then they uh, process that and send it to our office. So there is, um, there is some time dedication on the review of pistol permits. Okay, but as there's no decisions made whether or not to they give only, that permit. Correct. It, my, it is my decision as to whether or not the permit is issued. I'm the one that actually technically issues the temporary permit. But you don't, you don't have any decision. Yes, I do. You, so, you, you, so you're saying I right now you can deny a pistol you permit. Deny a pistol Absolutely. permit. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. I can deny a pistol permit. And there are times that we have denied a pistol permit at the town level because of a disqualifying uh, background check. Um, something came back in the background that becomes an automatic disqualifier. That is the process with a pistol permit. The towns. But that's have not to your personal decision. Correct. You, you're, I have you're, to ma enforce. you're making it based on Correct. based on a background check, but you're exactly. not you're not basing it on that that individual. Correct. I'm basing I'm basing it on the requirements of the qualifications based on their on their background, and I have our law enforcement review that. To sometimes we've had backgrounds come back that are. Murky, like they they report one thing and another thing, and it's unclear within the background check as to whether or not do they even have the right person. Um, some names can be very similar, and I want to before we disqualify an individual, I want to be sure, and I don't have access to that record background. Our law enforcement does, so they do that final review of that background before we make that um, determination based on that background. But yes, if the town, if I, as the town, um, dis, uh, deny a pistol permit, an individual does have the ability to appeal that um, at the state level. Our officers attend those, those appeals on behalf of the town to articulate to the um, appeals board why that denial was, um, why that denial was in place. Okay, so it's only not to not to be redundant, but so it's only denied. A person is only denied based on their background. So by law, there are two avenues that could arise a potential denial. One is an individual's background, and the other one is suitability. So suitability is very discretionary, and I will say that we haven't really, we, I don't know that we've had anybody based on suitability, but suitability may be something that it didn't pop through their background. They do, an, uh, they do a, a, a secondary background check through, um, through another profile to determine if somebody has had recent um, mental health committals um, and things like that. That would also be a disqualifying factor. Um, and that, so by law, there are actually two. I don't want to mislead you by saying it's only by background. There are two, any town can do this, there are two ways of denial. One is by background and the other one by statute is suitability. Now suitability is defined by the information received from the background. Um, it's not personal opinion. Well, I, I would say that that's how I treat it. I don't know that that's how every town treats it. Suitability is very vague within the statute. I, I treat it as based on the on the background. I don't know that every town does that. That would have to be, right? I, I, again, a person, if they feel that they have been unfairly denied, they then go to um, the, the appeals, um, and they can appeal that decision at the state level, and the state handles all the appeals. We don't handle the appeals locally. Those are all handled um, by the um, Firearms Appeals Board. Okay, because Rhode Island went through went through that whole situation where they, you know, because the police chief ha would have, as the town manager, have a, their own personal preference if they wanted to deny somebody or not, right. and that's that's against our constitutional rights. Yeah. Again, I base it all on background. Jason. Thank you. 
I, I will say that I know who the administrator that's running right now that we have on board. He is also local. He knows where the hot spots are. He knows where he knows the troublemakers. He, he's a local. He's worked with youth throughout throughout the years. So he's he's definitely plugged in and um, I know he knows a lot. Thank you. The reason why I was asking was I, I didn't realize that the clerical, the current year's clerical line included um, the police administrator, whereas the uh, the summary at the heading of that page just said that um, it included a police administrator, and uh, I saw the increase of 61000 over the previous year without realizing that some of that money was already in this year's current budget under clerical. Um, I just wanted to say that I appreciate my colleague Tammy's point about uh, the call volume and that that's large, that was heard and understood. I appreciate that. Um, I had a question about the highway, I think it was highway maintenance position, Mary, and you said if it was canceled, then you would have to sub out uh, some of the other projects. Could we then transfer some of those to capital projects then if they were subbed out? No, um, only if it's part of a capital project, and that would we we typically if it so capital projects, um, if it is part of a capital project, it's not housed within the operational budget. This would be um, we have throughout the year periodic times that we have to repair storm drainage. That's not part of a larger capital project, so we wouldn't charge capital projects for that. That's maintenance. And so that's within this operating budget. So if we're doing maintenance on a storm drainage, then that contractual service would be charged to the operating budget. Um, it wouldn't go to a capital budget because it's not part of an overall capital project, right? So we have to repair a storm drain, right? That's one drain. Um, and so we have to go through that. So that yeah, gets you would have to, to upgrade it, actually upgrade it, Correct. not just repair. So yeah. Thank so, you. Um, so there's that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I lost her. Under this uh, first scenario that you have, which is the least impact to the budget um, with a 0 0.88 uh, mill increase, you know, you'd mentioned that the salt and calcium, we could go upwards to 50,000. Mm -hmm. What would that be if we say we we went with this scenario, but we went to 50,000? Would it, is it, I don't think it's a dramatic change, but I'm just curious. Right. So now. if you went the additional 50,000, 25,000 is a, a further reduction of 0 0.02. Okay. So, so for each like 25,000, you would get 0 0.02. So it would go from 0 0.88 to 0 0.86. Okay. If you went to the 75, it would be uh, 0 0.84. Okay. Thank you. So I won't go off on it. Can I, anybody? <laughs> Go ahead, Patty. Okay. So I won't go off on a tangent again. Um, when I was talking about the constabulary, I'm sitting here in my basement, and it clicked in my head when we're talking about public safety. It was probably about nine years ago, 10 o'clock in the morning. I was in this house by myself. My husband was in upstate New York because he was a long haul trucker and I had to call 911 because there was somebody trying to break in my house. And I will tell you, it felt like forever before a police officer got here. I couldn't even tell you in real time what happened. My father ended up here. The police were here. My neighbor was here. But the point is a woman alone in her home with a local police department and and thankfully at the time it was nine years ago with troop d right down the road um i was very fortunate to have them available to come to me the guy had taken off by the time they got here but the next day he was on video in thompson trying to break into a couple other houses so that could have been my house and i was here alone with a dog um and i do thank the lord he didn't get in but the point is i was thankful those police were there and i think anyone else who understands a small town things can happen that you don't expect you want police officers who know the area know the community and are seasoned veterans 
um, available. So my so from there I'll segue in. Um, highway department mechanic Mary, you said we have two. Yes, we currently right have on. two filled positions. The third position is currently vacant. It's been vacant since January. We've been recruiting, but right now I've paused that recruitment. Okay. Um, how many vehicles do we have pieces of equipment that those two gentlemen work on? You're really testing my memory. So I did this a number of years ago when we were I actually, am. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. When we brought on. I'm trying on, to make a point. <laughs> so I want to say that we have around um, between 110 and 130 um, between police cars, town pool vehicles, uh, highway department vehicles, equipment, parks, parks equipment, um, and vehicles. I want to say, WPCA now. oh, and and our WPCA uh, equipment as well, which are also maintained. So I want to say we're probably right around the 100 and probably around 120. And I'm sure if Matt's watching, he'll correct me in the morning. But I, I want to say that's about where we're at. Might even be more than that with the WPCA. Okay, so of all those, um, we, out of, just an estimated number, how many of those v pieces of equipment require preventive maintenance and regular updates? All of them. That a certified mechanic would need? All of them. And only two mechanics are covering over 100 pieces of equipment. Correct. And we're talking dump trucks, dump pickup trucks, trucks. Yeah, loaders, pickup trucks, uh, pool vehicles, our, um, our mowers, um, our vac machines, our grapple trucks, all, all of the equipment, loaders, everything. Well, I will say I was a shop coordinator a truck fleet of over 300 tractors and 1800 trailers we had 43 mechanics and probably had mm, i don't know maybe 50 trucks at one location and i had 10 mechanics so bravo to your team i'm even more impressed right now i did not realize there were only two mechanics so we've been operating for the last number of years i want to say the last six years at least with three mechanics our third mechanic just recently left in Jan in the end of December, so we've been recruiting. Um, so that it's it's vacant, but we haven't been without a third mechanic for quite some time. But going forward, that's why I say going forward, if this third position were cut and um, we don't fill that vacant position, then um, I could foresee that we're going to need to outsource some of those repairs because there's just um, not the capability for two individuals to manage all of those uh, regular maintenances. So, so with all of those mechanic, um, sorry, with all those preventive maintenance and the updates and oil changes and all that, um, there were three, and from January to now, there's been a short. We're short one mechanic. Correct. Okay, so yeah, we need to fill that ASAP. And I'm assuming those mechanics, since it's heavy equipment and dump trucks and stuff, they have special certifications, correct? They're not going to go just find one at Jiffy Lube. Correct. We do require them to have background in um, heavy equipment maintenance. Okay. Thank you. Patty, well, I just want to uh, add one little piece to that. And I know you were talking about your truck fleet. Um, being in the in the repair industry myself and i do everything from vehicles to backhoes tree tr bucket trucks um everything i mean it's it's not necessarily how many vehicles are in a fleet it's a how well they've been maintained previously um age of the vehicles there's so many things that factor in because if you're only doing preventive maintenance and you're in your fleet's relatively newer um you can get away with, with a fewer amount of mechanics. Whereas if you're dealing with an older fleet that needs more work, um, that operators aren't as gentle on the equipment, um, then you're definitely going to need more mechanics. Um, so, I mean, it, it, as far as the amount of vehicles, if I told you the amount of vehicles I worked on in a year, your head would probably spin and wonder how I could I don't possibly do it. <laughs> your speech into the choir. So, I am from a fourth generation trucking family. I was a shop coordinator for years and I sold heavy equipment. 
So I know what you're saying. I was just making a very basic point. The preventive maintenance alone, when you're looking at DOT requirements, you have to be on schedule. You can't let those trucks on the road if PM is expired. I had no idea we only had two mechanics right now. I would have expected about five in a garage that size. So bravo to you, Mary. Really bravo to the guys. Mm. They're the ones that work their butts off out there. How many? Absolutely. How many mechanics does the Board of Ed have for their side of the fleet? I think they only have two. One or two. I think and, they have two. And they're operating out of the same building? They are. Okay. Comments from anyone? Um, I was going to say here, and uh, I don't know if I want to say recommend, but with the budget, the scenario when we increased the calcium to 50,000, and that would reduce the mill rate increase to 0.86, we're not losing any uh, mechanics positions. We would still be that, uh, looking to fill that position. And I think the other, con the other one at the 0.5 is... Uh, with eliminating all those the senior programs and the library hours and all that, I think that's uh, I, I think that's extreme. I don't think I would be in favor of that. This this one here, we're going to have to. We can't continue to go on. At some point, we're going to come to the cliff where we're going to jump. The mill rate is going to jump a lot at once. Um, so I don't know if I want to make a recommendation to see with the the. Uh, appeal is of this one here at 0 0.86 with 50,000 from the saw with the other members may feel this it would cut the BOE 1.3 million but it will still cover the ASO um, that they they're looking for because uh, I would want to fund the ASO program in the schools one thing I just mm -hmm. want to clarify is um, while we have control over how much goes to annual town meeting on the BOE side, we don't have any control over how they Correct. spend that money. Correct. <coughs> um, to go to go with Kevin, what if we went with seventy five on the salt? Um, I don't know where everybody feels on that. The ambulance service, um, you know what we have. For NDDH, we know 25 for off of the contingency can handle that. Um, Board of Ed, cut them 1.5. Because honest with you, from from what Patty's seen, what Michelle's seen, Ula's seen, I've seen, and I'm sure the rest of you have looked through it, there is way too much. I mean, we. We bring our own drinks, we bring our own snacks if we're at a meeting. There's no reason why taxpayers should be paying for their, the food for their meetings. There really shouldn't be. Because they're getting paid and the redundancy with the travel costs, these people are already on the clock. We're already paying their salaries to go wherever they're going. So I don't understand how you could spend over $100,000 to transport athletes when you already got another line item paying for bus drivers. And the town's already paying for your buses. The gas comes from the town, so you already got a break on that. So, I mean, there's, I, I hate to do it, and it's honestly, really, it's better than what happened last year when we gave them a dollar. So 200,000 is way better than a dollar. And and one thing I just want to add too is because this has been rattling around in my head as we talk about the BOE. Um, if you consider what their ask was last year, I believe they were asking for eight hundred eighty thousand dollar increase last year. Um, had they gotten an eight hundred eighty thousand dollar increase, what would the surplus they'd be turning back right now look like? Um, so I mean, it, it's the the fact that they were able to get by with. Um, with a dollar and not completely have to deplete the non-lapsing account, which which I give them credit for. I mean, it's just because they're turning back a surplus um, as opposed to another town that doesn't turn back a surplus. 
doesn't mean our Board of Ed isn't fiscally responsible because I can speak to a situation that um, th there was a Board of Ed, there was a, a school system where towards the end of the year they were just spending any penny they had left so they didn't have to turn it back. They went and filled a storage container full of paper, a non-climate controlled storage container full of paper. The paper went to waste from the humidity. So I would much rather see our Board of Ed turn back a surplus at the end of the year than try and spend every single penny because they're worried they won't get anything the following year. Um, but that being said, I, th they did definitely did demonstrate that they could get by on without that $880,000 and not have to completely depre uh, deplete the non-lapsing account. Um, I know a lot of their surplus is due to positions that haven't been filled, um, and I don't Personally, I don't see them having the ability to fill all those positions, and, and we see it on the town side with the mechanics position. Um, I, I see it in an industry I'm in. Um, other industries, I see it as well. And so it's a matter of they were able to do it and still turn back a surplus. Um, can they do that again? I don't know if they could. Um, I myself personally I do support them bringing on ASOs I 100% I do because I firmly believe the safety of our students is the uh, of the utmost importance um, as well as the safety of our residents when, as when we're talking about the constabulary as well um, I would be in I would be in favor of um, as uh, Ms. Wakefield had talked about the $75 the $75,000 cut um, from the salt line um, which I believe if we did that with the... So I just ran that scenario really quickly. Yep. <laughs> what um, Ms. Wakefield just proposed, the $75,000 out of, out of SALT, $120,000 out of the ambulance service, the thirteen out of NDDH, $25,000 out of contingency, and one point five from the Board of Education. That brings the mill rate increase to a point seven zero. What is it, Mayor? Point zero, zero. So it would be a 7.0 seven. Seven mil, inc a point, I'm sorry, point, a point, point seven, seven, sorry. Six. It's late. A point seven zero mil increase. So um, for the BOE budget, I have a reduction of 1.5 million. So that would they get 275. About 275 would be their increase. 275,000 would be their increase. And how much is that? 417,000 is what they reflected in their decision package. And that's eliminating KB's request? It's not oh. all of it's eliminated. It's removing 120,000 of that $145,000 oh. request. So it Where does it okay. um, provide some increase to that KB ambulance request. Right. Uh, and I will say too that first off, that's 25,000 additional to KB. So I wasn't for getting rid of the entire request, obviously. Um, I definitely understand probably more than most there, um, the, the need. Uh, personally, I, I know I've mentioned to some c other council members, I, I would love to see us go up a little further with the, the, the ambulance, but I, I will leave that to, I've, I've told you where I feel, feel about it, but that's up to you guys. Um, but um, with the um, Board of Ed, the one thing I want to point out is the town council has no control of the line items. Um, even at the annual town meeting, the, the town's folks do not have control over the line items for the Board of Education. But the Board of Ed does have control over their own line items. So they, you know, I, I know we have expressed um, uh, support for the ASOs. Um, and I know, in talking with Ms. George as well, um, the actual uh, market analysis of our teachers right now, I, I personally am in support of their salary increases as well. Uh, because that would help to bring them up to a, a not top tier, but I think if I believe I remember correctly, at least the, the median um, for the market currently. So I would be supportive of that. But again, going back to the fact that we are looking at budget surplus every year, which I don't want to, like you know, the chairman's already said, I don't want to um, see somebody not have a budget surplus because and punish them for a budget surplus. Um, because we don't want them coming back to us halfway through the year saying, hey, we kind of spent everything. Uh, we need some more. So we don't want that either. Um, but at the same point, we have to obviously balance that. So I think I agree with Tammy that 1.5 is, is more than should be enough along with the 2 million on non-lapsing non as well. 
Do you know what the current balance is in the non lapsing account? So they uh, really 1.75 million. So they've only used roughly right, and so the amount that they had um, determined the 253,000 that they were um, going to potentially utilize if needed for the current year budget, they're not going to have to utilize. So they're still they're turning back. Um, you know, I think they were estimating a little over a million on turn back this year, so they're not going to be utilizing the 250 for that. So they 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 have dedicated funds out of the non lapsing over the current year. So their projection. their projection is 1.7 for the end of this year, for the end of this year. and then um, so there'll be room for it, them to make the request to um, put to replenish that account. And they they haven't we haven't actually gotten their actual money back from the previous. So that action hasn't taken yet because the audit hasn't been completed. Okay. Um, so we would be, I believe, looking to put that on the council's agenda for May. Um, I believe that we'll have draft audit by then, so the council will then have audited numbers to consider um, in the ask. So they have submitted the ask, but that action hasn't come before you because that comes before you at the time of a draft audit. So we have audited numbers and we know that there's not going to be any additional adjustments to that fund as you're making that decision. So approximately, they're turning back how much? From last year? 3.6 3. million. Yeah, 3.6 million oh, is what their turn back is from last year. But that doesn't oh. include, they request their non-lapsing off. Sorry. That they would request their non-lapsing off of that. So that's, the, that's the total total, um, not net of what their non-lapsing request was. So they're going to turn back approximately 3.6 million. So to turn them back up to the 2 million, they're going to need a, an extra four. So they're turning back over 3 million. No, the 1.7 figure that we just gave you would assume that they last year. Yeah, last year. Yeah, yeah last against year. their la last year. Non-lapsing. How much are they going to move into non-lapsing for last year? 746,000. Mm -hmm. So. So it'll be just a little under $3 million that will be increasing fund balance from last year for their turnbacks. If the uh, request that they have put forward for uh, replenishing non-lapsing is approved by the town council for last fiscal year. So Mary, the 3.6 million, that's money that has already been in a budget and the taxpayers have already paid for, correct? Or am I correct. wrong? Correct, that's last fiscal year's budget. That's how much was remained unspent. Fiscal year and how much, of, how much does that equal in a mill? How that many is, mills? Please. So 1.3 million is a mill. So it's about two and a half mills. And that's coming back. That's what they have not spent from last of their budget from last year. Correct, from last fiscal year. And okay. But does that include the non-lapsing account? Because I kind of lost. No, you. that's no. separate. Non-lapsing is okay. separate from this. So they are yeah. they, So to break it down again, they're um, they're returning unspent from the pr prior fiscal year three point six million. Of that 3.6 million, they have a request to replenish their non-lapsing back to the 2 million two mark million. Okay. of about 700,000. So the total increase to the fund balance is gonna be just under 3 million, about 2.9, 2.8, 2.9 million. Um, they, will then they will then have the full 2 million, which we have projected in that number of balance of 1.7 million for the current year. Um, they will have a two. They will have their two million in their non-lapsing account. So they still have the full two million from their non-lapsing at the end of last fiscal year. Makes sense? So I got two questions, probably not budgetary, but budgetary. Um, so I'm 100% for the A. So I think they're a great idea. Um, my first question is: um, so the renovations to the to KMS have we? Our entry points have that has that been addressed as to vulnerability, as because if they're tempered glass, we've all we've all seen it a million times. If somebody wants to get in, they're going to get in. 
with the tempered glass. Did we take any precautions to protect against that? Yeah, so the building, the, uh, bu the Permanent Building Commission evaluated that throughout the process. Um, they maintained consistence, consistent um, application of what they have done for all of the windows. We did the window project at KMS and the entry door um, project prior to this project with KMS, and they did do impact resistance. They didn't do bulletproof because of cost factors. Bulletproof was substantially more, and it was not within the budget. So they opted to go for impact resistance. It does... Uh, delay but it will still have a penetration um, but they have been that has been an active conversation in the permanent building commission throughout the KMS project um, and I'm sure it will continue through even the Westfield Avenue project but um, we have talked about um, entry points within Westfield Avenue project as well so yes they have um, had lengthy conversations around entry points windows and interior uh, materials for interior um, walls. So it's just a, a thinner film, I would Correct. assume, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. it does. They've, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, videos and demonstrations of, you know, what does that mean um, on that impact resistance to glazing um, over it, um, and there is penetration. It takes uh, substantially more effort than just. Um, a regular window in order for um, access to be gained. There's a lot more shots that have to happen, and the more shots that happen on the exterior, it's time. It's time, right? right. It's all Everything's time and time. it's response, right? right. So and it gives you time to get somebody that's armed. Exactly. So that was the thought process around that was it would it would delay any potential entry, but it wouldn't necessarily fully prohibit an entry. Um, and they felt that that was the best balance. That was that was the balance that could be achieved to be able to provide that added security um, in the budget constraints that they were in. Is there any thoughts for the rest of the schools so, to move uh, forward we with did, that? Yeah, we did um, entry doors for uh, KMS, um, KCS, I don't think we did KISS. Um, those were all done as impact resistance. Um, I believe the capital improvement plan for the Board of Education includes in an outer year um, Door, entry doors for uh, KIS, um, and I'm sure that the Permanent Building Commission, when that project is eventually um, assigned to them, that they would pursue um, similar impact resistance for the other ones. So as they go through and have those projects come up, that is definitely a high focal point for the Permanent Building Commission. Thanks. To, um, to get to point five, what would it take... How much more would we have to cut to get to point to get five? to point five over the point seven? So recognize that the so the scenario two gets you a point five three. Yeah, but at the same time we're hurting the kids and we're hurting the elderly. Right. So I'm just saying for for perspective. Oh, I know. The half of the one point five million dollar board of education cut is on that scenario two. Okay. As well as. You know, the only addition to that number from what I'm seeing from what you've discussed is adding additional um, $25,000 to the SALT reduction, and that would get you to a 0 0.51 mil increase. Okay. So, so you know, that's your reference point. We, we got, so basically we would have to come up with another 100, almost 100,000 to get to 0.5. Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in favor of cutting anything that's going to take away programming for our our town. I think we we've, we've been recognized with our Parks and Rec department multiple times, and our library staff. It, I mean, this is Ms. Fedor came to our last meeting and she spoke very much about the library, and the library is utilized. It's utilized year round. Right. So in order to bring this, the number your your ask was how many, how much more? It would be closer to about two hundred and sixty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. Would be additional cuts required on the town side to bring it to a point five. Now I I have one question. Um, talking about this three million dollars that would be getting turned back from the board of ed from their surplus, um, in this budget packet that you presented. Where it's got the proposed uh, fund balance for 23-24, is any of their surplus that would be coming back reflected yes. in that amount? Yes, 
We've accounted okay. for that within the account, which is really why the proposal to maintain the um, uh, the road program that you initiated last year, you can continue to fund that. Again, you know, long term, there's going to, you know, eventually we're going to need to make decisions around that versus utilizing fund balance, depending on how much continues to be returned overall um, year over year. But that gave you the, the opportunity, which was what had been discussed in the previous year, because we had during the budgetary process in the previous year, we had an indication that there was going to be a substantial turn back again from that year. And so it was utilized. I will say we've already done Connecticut Mills. It looks great. They just finished paving it. They haven't done the curbing yet, but they stripped it down and it's already repaved. So we're yeah, up and I heard complaints about the trees that got cut down over there. Oh, well. I, I had a question. So, Mr. Wood, yes, I maybe misunderstood you, but I'd like to hear more about your KB because I believe that I just make one statement. I believe that we could this this could backfire on us just because of the comment that that gentleman made that evening where he say cuz I asked him I says well, what happens if we just say no and he said well you're going to have to deal with the service that you're going to get so that kind of leaves them open to you you know what i mean yeah i think i, I, I and correct me if i'm not understanding you fully yeah, I think um, I can't speak for KB Ambulance. I don't work for them. I don't, uh, you know, I, I work in EMS, but I don't work for them. Um, I will say that I recently had a conversation with Chief Varga. Um, him and I sat down, had had a little bit more of a talk, and he's on, in the understanding um, kind of where uh, I know I personally am about things because I, I'm not uh, for the full 145, but I am for getting them up to 150 personally. Um, which is a $40,000 increase uh, over last year's budget. But um, their operations, it depends on what they see fit to do. If they choose to reduce their operations, that is 100% on them. Uh, the town's liability, the, town's, the town is only required to have an ambulance service that provides service to the town. Uh, that's, that's where we really stand. Uh, what KB does beyond that is beyond the town's control. So does that does that answer you a little bit? Yeah, my first my first question was when you you said you had a different view on the KB ambulance. Right. I wasn't sure if you were going up, you were going down. So you want to go up? Right, just a little bit. Right, not, not and, and I just I just see that could be an issue because right. if something happens, automatically they're going to say, "Hey, we told you we needed the money." Co correct, and again, the, what they do is well beyond any of our control. Yeah. yeah, we we can't control what they do. Same thing for our fire departments. You know, there's tax. Each ta each fire department has their own tax district, um, and what they do is well beyond the control. The taxpayers in those districts make the decision to s agree to we're going to pay this much in taxes, and what those departments do is well beyond our control. So, generally speaking, I will say that um, in some of my conversations, it seems like they are going to try to maintain what they're doing currently. Um, but I can't speak for what they're going to do. To be to be one hundred percent honest, right, right. Honest. Kind of like the board of education budget. We can Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Whatever. And then they we have no control. I, I, yeah. And Andy, I I can like Ray. I know quite a few of the EMS and the EMTs and EMRs that in, and medics that are in this area. Um, I don't think they have the same opinion that the board members from KB had expressed that night. Because I know most most of the EMTs, EMRs, paramedics I know, when the alarm goes off, they respond. And, and they and they they my daughter is one of them, and she some nights she it's nonstop and she drops, goes back out, picks up another one, goes back, you know, making eight and ten trips to the hospital in a in a, in a shift is not unusual. And, and for they are obligated so the state of Connecticut sets a regulation of you're obligated for 50 51 percent I always forget where we fall on that one percent but 50 51 percent of your first crew calls that have to be responded to KB ambulance has responded to 100 percent of their first crew calls and probably over the last 23 years at least you know even being when they were fully volunteer or a very small mix of paid volunteer 
they were doing phenomenal work even then. Mm -hmm. I know because I was 13 years old when I needed their service once. The one and only time I've ever needed an ambulance, and they showed up in the middle of the night. So that's good. You know, that's uh, a testament mm -hmm. to them and uh, what they have been able to do. But I, I, again, I can't speak for what they're going to do moving forward. So just to uh, kind of give you the context of impact on that, if we were to change the number from $120,000 cut to $105,000 cut, which is that additional 40000 added to their budget, and keeping the same scenario that Tammy had proposed that the $75,000 SALT cut and the 1.5 BOE, instead of it being a 0 0.70 mill rate increase, it becomes a 0 0.71. So it adds 0 0.01 for that additional 15000 So just, I, I handed out the, the resolution that was before you. Uh, the, I know you did a first and a second, but that didn't have numbers written in it. Yeah. So um, the, in order for this resolution to be truly voted on, you would have to determine um, what those, what e we'd have to fill in the blanks for those, for those numbers. So this most recent scenario we discussed, which brings, um, yep, so that would be a $75,000 cut on the salt and calcium. Um, let's make sure I'm on that right. So it would be a $75,000 cut on salt, yep. a $105,000 cut to um, the ambulance service, 13,306,000 cut to the NDDH line, $25,000 cut to the contingency line on the town side, and $1.5 million cut to the Board of Education. Do you want the town, what the town, each of those town, what each of those totals would be for general government and the Board of Education? I can um, recite them out, but I didn't want to do yeah, that without. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so for the town number, we're, we're grabbing that very quickly. Becomes So to just confirm, twenty five. Five one one eight one one. How did you say, Ashley? Hold on a second. Three zero six. <laughs> Sorry, it's twenty five five one one eight zero eight. Eight zero eight. Sorry, eight zero eight. So that would be the town's budget, and then the board of education. That's one point five. That's easy. And yes, I do have her do this in the actual budget document because one year. I did it in a different spreadsheet and I messed up the Board of Education and it totally was bad. haunted me for three years. So we redo it in here to confirm all the numbers. <laughs> so it's 45,000. 45, 45 million. Four, sorry. 45 million, 305,118 dollars. Yes. 45,305,118. Thank you. And the total? Seventy million eight hundred and sixteen thousand nine hundred and twenty six. So if you were to follow through, if you were to move forward with that scenario, those would be your three numbers within the resolution for blanks. Now, I know you had given scenarios before on what that kind of mill rate would look like depending on what a house is worth. Let's go with roughly a $250,000 house. What does a 0 0.71 mill increase look like? And that's appraised value, not assessed value. Uh, 
I'm just verifying to make sure I calculated right. It's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So the annual increase would be $124.25. On a $250,000? Correct. On a $250,000 property value with an assessed value, that would bring an assessed value at $175,000. Okay. And so that would result in an annual tax increase of $124.25 or a monthly $10. of $10.35. Thank you. Well, I will run around the room on this one before we uh, make a motion to actually in, in put numbers in here. Um, the numbers that we're at, um, Mr. Whitehead, would you feel comfortable with those? No. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Murphy? Okay. Mr. Wood? Yes. Mr. Cartool? Yes. Yes. Lula? Yeah. I'd really like to make the BOEs a dollar for that. <laughs> <laughs> How much they're returning. <coughs> I mean, I, I understand why you only want a dollar, because honest with you, if they're turning back 3.6 and they wanted another 1.7 on top of what they had already asked for last year, um, yeah, I understand why you want to give them a buck, but at the same time, they got expenses. I get that. Um, some of the stuff they've cut, maybe they'll actually put stuff back that'll benefit the students. They um, haven't cut in the right places. I know they have. I know they haven't cut, and we have no say over that. But you know what? That's where the parents and the residents in town have to hold them accountable. And you know, our job is let's just we'll put the spotlight on them and. Maybe they don't like the don't like the bright lights. Well, maybe you should do something about that. But um, I don't. They, I've said it before. You you can't keep growing a town. And no money doesn't make kids smarter. But you can't keep going at a zero because eventually you're going to fall behind. Yeah. So well, not at this rate, they won't fall behind. Oh, I know. So, Ula, was that a yay or nay? Uh, Patty, are you with us? I am. How do you feel where we're at right now? Uh, I think this is one of the toughest part of our jobs. I agree. And I agree with Tammy. Putting a spotlight on the issues is also our job and hopefully will be effective um finally the amount of money that and i and i i keep saying it and it's not on one person it's an issue through multiple administrations in the school district there's a lot of waste or mismanagement i don't know what it is but something's got to be done about it when you have 2.5 of a mil taxpayers are already paid down that's getting put back in the general fund that's a major problem and the fact that we now in order to sustain our employees and our current conditions for the town which is affected by the schools obviously um it, it's very concerning and of course no i don't want to support any increase but in the economy we're in, we, 
you know, 0.71 of a mil is a much better scenario than we could be facing. Um, if we had someone different than Mary and her entire team steering the ship. So unfortunately, I, yeah, I guess I have to say yes. And I'm very disappointed that the BOE wasn't here tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Um, since I got elected, I've, I've always pushed for trying to keep taxes flat every single year, um, trying to find ways to cut. And um, I know you can only do that for so long due to whether it's inflation or you're looking at contractual uh, wage increases um, for the unions and, um, and non-union wages as well because you, you want to be able to retain your staff. Um, so I, I, the cost of everything goes up, and as much as I would love to, I'd love to see a zero mil increase year after year after year. Um, I know this year, especially the fact that we're looking at uh, roughly four hundred thousand dollar increase in debt services to go towards a project that the project got kicked down the road for way too many years, um, and that's one thing that. When I came out of the council, I, I realized how many things in town um, previous councils have pushed off and pushed off. And especially now, considering the fact with, with inflation over these past 20, 25 years, let alone recently, if these projects had gotten done 10, 15 years ago rather than waiting till now, how much of a cost savings would that have been to the taxpayers? Instead of now we're looking at $30 million project where it might have only been $12 million if it had gotten done 10 years ago. Um, so, I mean, it, it's unfortunately it gets to a point where uh, the foot's got to hit the road, where, where you you, you got to get going with something. you got to start moving things forward. And KMS w was a prime example. Um, I was thankful for when our town manager brought us for a tour of the town buildings so we could as council members we could actually see the conditions these buildings were in um seeing a bathroom in a inside of a classroom that they couldn't use because of the decay of the floor um was completely unacceptable to me i mean that was and i don't know how many uh, people in town are aware how bad the conditions were at, at kms um or uh, the, the conditions of the community center. Um, I mean, it, these are buildings that very minimal maintenance have been done for years just to keep them going. And none of the projects that, I shouldn't say none of the projects, a lot of the projects that should have been addressed were put off. Um, and I understand that trying to keep Killingly affordable for our businesses, for our residents is extremely critical. But at the same time, having infrastructure that isn't falling apart is, is critical as well. Um, and I, as much as I struggle with it, with a 0.71 mil increase, um, considering the, in, the inflationary environment we're in right now, um, as much as I hate to say I'd support it, I, I would support the 0.71. Um, Michelle, I don't know if you want to add anything or... Uh, I mean, the only way I feel <coughs> is that I would like time, one more time for us to get together and look through it again and make sure that we're not missing anything. I mean, I'll still look at number two. I know it seems like people are uh, committed to not cutting anything. I might say there's 26 temporary recreational of uh, those high school students, like during the season. It's Camp Wallaby. Yeah, yeah. So I might say, how do people feel about that? Like, I, I personally would, wouldn't mind looking at it one more time to make sure. Everybody might just say, no, absolutely not, and that's cool. I just feel like that's all I think about. That's why I said abstain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I can appreciate that. Um, the other thing, too, is there's – as much as I hate to extend a meeting um, or basically have another meeting um, – I, as much as I want to get through this at the same time, I, the one thing I think about is if we table this and come back tomorrow, um, 
there's a possibility that Mr. Grandowski might be able to be here and we could hear some input from him as well because um, I would like to include him as well. I know it's unfortunate. Um, he had something that came up where he couldn't be here this evening. Um, I mean, there's always the annual town meeting. Mm -hmm. That's right. True. So we get, if we put these numbers out there, then people get talking. And maybe they'll, maybe they'll get a hold of the Board of Ed budget and start making noise. Yeah. It, that would also address any concerns, too, that you have. I was, was going to bring that up, but thank you, Tammy. That, um, you know, the, board, the annual town meeting, this isn't, this isn't the overall final end-all, be-all. So yeah. we do still have the annual town meeting where not only us collectively um, can look, continue to look at this, it's the town themselves, and they, they have the, and I'm very grateful that we have the right and the ability to come forward, and they can make changes to any of our line items, as well as uh, discuss a lot of the other issues that are going on. So, the um, the taxpayers don't have the extended budget that we have from the BOE. They don't know what the other objects are, so they're missing all of that information pizza it's not just pizza <laughs> and I, I don't and, and I don't think the budget was actually posted till a couple of days ago the board of ed budget yeah, yeah and I, I received several comments um, last week that the board of ed budget still wasn't on the BOE's website which was rather disappointing Jen saying that she did find it on their website so I, I, I did it. find it it's basically a duplicate of the main budget book that everyone got it's um hang on I'll pull it up again so it's not the line by line that we get no is no, there so any way to post that that's up to them it's basically yeah. the carbon copy of the budget book that was all handed out but it is there and if you go under district it'll say 2324 budget so that is that's what I what Ula just said could we ask that they put it up I can relay that message to the superintendent and it's up to the Board of Education as to whether or not they that they want to post that uh, the worksheets that they provided again the worksheets that they the expanded detail that they provided the board of the town council in their um, was it doesn't directly tie to the final budget because there were some modifications or changes that were made afterwards that aren't reflective within that detail but um they had the board of education chair and vice chair had agreed with the superintendent to provide those to the town council i don't know if i don't know their opinion as far as posting that on the website i can pass that message along to the superintendent okay thank you thank you and the the budget that looks like the budget uh book that everyone already received is Killingly Public Schools. If you go to the business office, there's a section, if you scroll down, that says 2324 budget BOE approved. So it is there in that format. Thank you. I must have been looking in the wrong spot on their website. I must have as well. <laughs> I, I can tell you looking at budgets just yesterday alone, uh, various budgets, town budgets, not even BOE budgets. Killingly does a great job of putting it right there on the front page when you log in or when you go onto that website, whereas the other towns I was looking at, I had to, like, search and find and call mm -hmm. in an archaeologist, things like that. <laughs> so it's crazy. Wow. <laughs> All right. So um, we had a uh, motion in a second. Um, so at this time, um, so I think for Robert rules, you would probably want to ask the motion, the person that motioned in second, if they want to withdraw and then fill in your number blanks and ask for a new first and second on that. Oh, because I was going to ask for an amendment to the motion, oh, but we could do that too. You could do that too. Yeah. I, I can amend. Oh, you would need to extend. You're at oh. 930. Do you want to extend for a few minutes? I'll make a motion to extend yep. a few minutes to finish uh, the resolution, the amended resolution. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Cotula, second by Mr. Wood to extend this meeting. Um, discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed?
Abstentions. One opposition. Uh, abstentions. Uh, motion carries. All right. So. Um, so I can make an amendment to the. Now, did you you made the original I think, I motion? Think, yeah. I w can can I amend my? I would like to amend my motion to include the numbers as provided to the town council for the. Do you need me to say them? Or you? I, do you want me to read them off? Sure. So the um, town's general government budget would be in the amount of $25,511,808. Uh, be allocated to the general government budget. And $45,305,000 allocated to education for a total combined budget of $70,816,926 um, and it would finish as is approved and shall be filed with the town clerk for submission to the annual town meeting for its adoption. That's that's how I want to make the, that's what I'd like to amend my motion. I'll second Ms. Wakefield's amendment. We've got a motion to amend the motion and a second. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Actually, I didn't allow for discussion. Oh, good. Yep. Um, motion carries. So the amendment. Um, to the motion passes. So now we are, um, uh, any further discussion on the amended motion? What is it again? So we, put the, we put the numbers in. Yep. As opposed to this. Okay. 0.71 increase. No, I mean, what is the oh. motion? Okay. So we, we had an amendment. We had a motion to amend the original motion. That amendment added the numbers, the budgetary numbers, into the original motion. So now that we have this amended, the amendment to the motion passed, now I'm asking for any further discussion regarding the motion as it's been amended. Meaning, any discussion on it now that we've added the numbers Okay, in. the only thing I would like to say is I reiterate that I would prefer to have another conversation with just us, but just so it's noted. I agree. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as amended say aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yep. Uh, motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is adjournment. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion Amen. has been made by Mr. Wood. I'll second it. I second by Mr. Catula. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? This meeting is adjourned.